Okay, everyone. Thanks, Carl. Uh, welcome to uh, another session of the West Talk series. And um, by now, you probably already know that West Talks is presented by IC Impacts, which is the Canada India Research Center for Excellence um, to promote international collaboration um, between Canada and India. And the UBC Future Waters Group, which was started last year with um, a focus on carrying out interdisciplinary water research um, on campus. Before uh, I get on with the intro slides for the West Talks, um, if you're interested in actually attending a, an amazing conference which has been going on for the past um, six to seven years, uh, make sure you visit uh, the link that's given over here. We'll put it in the chat box as well. But the West Conference is back this year and it's gonna be held from June 9 to 11. So uh, we're accepting abstracts now, so please make sure you register online. All right, so this is the wonderful committee that I've got the chance to work with over the last um, seven, eight months. Uh, we have Fuhar, Carl, um, uh, and Leili from UBC. And there's Jaskaran who's um, joining us from University of Guelph, and he's a postdoctoral fellow there. And finally, we have Feria, who's, who's really been helping upload all the um, uh, past um, talks on YouTube and sending you out the emails and all of that stuff. Uh, this is a map which was quite mind-boggling to me. Uh, we received this just last week, and this goes to show the reach that we've had uh, with the West Talks, and it, I think it's quite impressive, and it makes the team feel pretty proud that we've actually got to reach so many people across the world. And um, if you've already not filled this map out, and we'll put the link for this as well in the chat, please make sure uh, you put your name up there. Finally, uh, this is the list of speakers that we had lined up for this term. And of course, we are going forward after March 25th as well. But today we have Dr. Anthony Straub, who's gonna be talking about putting bubbles to work, emerging applications of hydrophobic membranes in water treatment and power generation. Um, if you haven't already seen um, our YouTube page, uh, the IC Impacts YouTube page, uh, please make sure you visit and you um, see the past talks if you already hadn't attended them. And it's my great pleasure to um, introduce the speaker for today, uh, also because he was my TA during my master's and he gave me great grades. So thank you for that. Uh, but Dr. Anthony Straub is an assist assistant professor in the environmental engineering program at Colorado Boulder and is ro rostered in the Department of Civil, Environmental and Architectural Engineering. His group leverages innovations in materials design to address critical environmental challenges related to sustainable water and energy. Much of his interest lies in developing next generation membrane materials to improve the efficiency of water reuse and desalination. Dr. Straub obtained his bachelor's in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, and he earned his PhD, MSc, and MPhil, that's a lot of degrees, at Yale University uh, in the Department of Chemical and Environmental Engineering, where he was also a National Science Foundation graduate research fellow. Prior to starting at Boulder, Dr. Straub worked as a postdoctoral researcher in the Department of Material Science and MIT, supported by Swiss National Science Foundation postdoctoral fellowship. So um, welcome, Tony. And if you have any questions, please leave them in the chat box and we'll get them at the end of the talk. So I hand it over to Tony now for to share your slides. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot, Alishak. Yeah. Uh, let me get this going. And okay looks good right all right cool thanks thanks everybody for organizing i'm super excited to to i guess see everybody again and, and see some old friends here too so it's kind of a funny title putting bubbles to work but i, I like this like the concept of bubbles a lot um and so really what i'm talking about today is a, a new type of membrane that we think might have some use in in water treatment and power generation and, and we see it as quite promising so just to kind of prime you for what I'm going to talk about today, uh, I'm just going to give you a motivation for why you know, we might need improved membranes. And then we're going to go into uh, here, we're going to go into introduce this concept of vapor gap membranes, which are the subject of this talk. I'm going to talk about some work we did initially looking at these membranes in osmotic systems. And then I'm going to talk about some now unpublished work where we demonstrate the use of these membranes in reverse osmosis, which we think has a lot, a lot of promise. And then finally, I'm just gonna go through some uh, you know, conclusions, maybe talk about power generation a little bit, depending on time. Um, sorry, I keep on getting these notifications. Okay, here we go. So before I go into the talk, um, I wanted to just acknowledge the team of people behind this work. 
Um, I'm very lucky to have worked with a lot of talented individuals that are, you know, smarter than me in my group, uh, including uh, my student Jiang and Sangsuk, who were my first two students and did a lot of the work here. Jiang, I, I see he's over here, so you can wave if you want to. Um, and then also Elizabeth, uh, Trisha, Kian, and Hannah. Hannah's an undergraduate in the group. They've all contributed a lot intellectually to this work, and uh, I'm really, really grateful to work with all these people. Um, I want, also want to acknowledge um, my collaborator and old friend Jung Ho Lee at UBC, um, who uh, I've worked with for, for much of what I'll talk about today. So the work that I'm talking about today is really motivated by the issue of global water scarcity. So this is, this is an old map, but I kind of like looking at it. This is from this Hoekstra paper in 2016, and it shows the number of months in which we would define there being water scarcity in different places. So, you know, darker is more water scarce. And you can kind of see, you know, around the world, you know, Mediterranean areas, Middle East, South Africa, Australia, and kind of the Western United States all suffer from pretty high levels of water scarcity. And so this is obviously a problem economically. We need water for agriculture. We need it for um, industrial operations, for power generation. Um, and also it's, it's an issue in some places, it's an issue of, of just security and, and livelihood. Um, we predict that water scarcity is going to get worse worse um, with climate change and uh, increasing populations. And in fact, someone in my department actually just came out with a paper in science um, showing the contribution of anthropogenic warming to creating uh, um, the worst uh, or the most severe mega drought in the past, I think, half millennia. So we're really seeing a lot of abnormal water scarcity events occurring. And so to address water scarcity, to manage water, you know, the best things we can do are, are manage what we already have. We can implement conservation measures. We can more smartly use the available sources. But eventually, we need to start thinking about accessing sources beyond what's available from the traditional hydrogeologic cycle. And that's where desalination and water reuse are really kind of the only options available to, to get something outside that natural hydrogeologic cycle. And so desalination is where we take salty water. This can be brackish water, so like inland groundwater. This can be seawater. Uh, it can be some high salinity brine. And we, we take out the pure water from that so we can use it. And then we emit some you know, brine stream afterwards. And so this is a, a, a nice schematic of a conventional seawater desalination facility. You're pulling in some seawater over here. You put it through some pretreatment. You remove the salts in reverse osmosis. And then you do some post-treatment, then people can you know, use it, go about their day. Um, water reuse is also a great option. And in many ways, it's a better option than desalination. Uh, and this is where we can take water reuse and we can con uh, water, wastewater, and we can consider using it either for direct potable or indirect potable or agricultural use. And so this is one treatment train of uh, wastewater reuse here, where you kind of have conventional wastewater treatment followed by uh, microfiltration, RO, and then advanced oxidation. And so for, for both desalination and water reuse, the key is really to be able to remove almost everything. You need to be able to remove the salts. You need to be able to remove a lot of the contaminants in this wastewater. And for this, the process of reverse osmosis is really well suited. Uh, and so in desalination, most new facilities use the reverse osmosis process. In water reuse, kind of the more standard configuration uses RO um, in their systems. Um, and so the question is, why, how, why has reverse osmosis become so dominant in these kind of advanced water treatment systems? And so for those of you not familiar, reverse osmosis works by essentially taking some feed water, you put it through a high pressure pump, and then that goes into a membrane module where the water permeates through the membrane. Most other things are rejected into some brine stream and you're left with some purified permeate water. And so reverse osmosis is so widely used partially because it's very efficient. Um, and so this is the energy use of reverse osmosis compared to thermal separation processes that can also remove a lot of salts, multi-effect distillation, multi-stage flash. And we can see that reverse osmosis is you know, around an order of magnitude lower energy consumption. And it really approaches the thermodynamic minimum energy consumption. Um, and so it's, it's very efficient is one reason why it's widely used. Um, you get consistent product water quality. So all the water has to go through these membranes. You can, you can be guaranteed some level of, of water quality. And the other thing that's nice about reverse osmosis is it's scalable with modular components. So my parents, they live in Phoenix. 
they have a little RO unit like, you know, under the sink that they use to treat some of the water. And then, you know, you can go to Israel to the SORIC desalination facility and the units are, this is an, a single RO module. And they actually, this is a, a new design, but they basically designed the RO modules. They're so big, you can just pick them up with a crane and place them directly in the facility. They're, they're expanding the membrane area so, so much to produce a lot of water. So it's very, very scalable. Um, so we use reverse osmosis a lot. And at the heart of this process is the thin film composite reverse osmosis membrane. Um, and so this is the, the kind of the membrane that is very standard nowadays. Um, it was developed initially in the 1970s. It's since become kind of ubiquitous at desalination facilities. And so this membrane, it, it consists of an active layer, which is difficult to see. It's a very thin layer that actually conducts the separations. And then it has a hydrophilic support layer, which is used to provide some kind of mechanical support to this very flimsy uh, active layer. The active layer itself is made of a cross-linked aromatic polyamide. It's uh, made by the reaction of N-phenylenediamine with trimacillic chloride, typically. Um, and it has a structure. This is a TM image of the cross-section here. So the polyamide layer is, it's about 100 nanometers thick. It's, it's very thin, and it's this kind of highly cross-linked polymer here. And so with conventional TFC membranes, um, the, the separation is due to preferential sorption and diffusion. So you can imagine this is a highly cross-linked polymer network. Um, you can imagine it as like, I don't know, like spaghetti moving around that are kind of like linked together at some points. Eventually there's some void that opens up as there's you know, these fluctuations. Um, water will enter the membrane phase, so it'll enter the polymer, be in there, and then it'll diffuse through voids inside the membrane to exit. And the mechanism of separation is just that hydrated salts tend to have a, a larger size or more um, electrostatic interactions that will kind of prevent them from going through the membrane. So this is what we use now. This is what we've used for a long time. And to be honest, it works very well. It, it's cheap and it, it's high rejection for, it works pretty well for most things. Um, but of course we're doing research and there are definitely things that are very well established with TFC membranes that need to be improved that limit its use and its effectiveness. Um, one issue with TFC membranes is in terms of their selectivity. Um, so the selectivity mechanism in TFC membranes fundamentally limits how much they can remove certain contaminants. And in particular, conventional polyamide desalination membranes poorly reject small neutral solutes. So this is from the literature. This is showing the rejection of various solutes as a function of molecular weight. And you can see the solid ones here are neutral molecules or neutral solutes. And as you go to the left here, as you go to decreasing size, you can see neutral solutes start to penetrate the membrane. And so we have things like NDMA and urea that you really don't want in your permeate water um, going through the membrane. And so removal of these, these contaminants, boron also falls in this category, urea, micropollutants, it requires additional treatment steps after RO to make sure they're gone. And that ends up adding cost, it adds footprint, you know, it's, it's a much less elegant process because of it. The other issue with TFC membranes is that they're damaged by oxidants. So you imagine, okay, you're running, you're, you're filtering water through this membrane for a long period of time. Eventually, you're going to get a lot of crud on the surface. You're going to get a buildup of organic matter. You're going to get a buildup of, you know, micro, uh, some, some biological materials on the membrane, and you want to clean it off. And ideally, the way you would clean it off is you would use something like chlorine or ozone, some commonly used kind of, you know, uh, cleaning agent that we already use in, in water treatment. But with TFC membranes, you, you can't do that. Uh, if you, you chlorinate the membranes, you will damage the, the, the structure of polyamide. You will eventually start to degrade it. And so this is just showing some reaction mechanisms of chlorination that will end up damaging the, the aromatic polyamide structure. And so what, what this, the, the, this damage from oxidants really is a problem for TFC membranes, because what it means is that you have to pretreat the water a lot to remove everything coming into the membrane. Or, you know, if you do end up exposing the membranes to uh, oxidants, which sometimes is the case, you, you need to think about replacing the membranes after a shorter period, which is going to add some cost to the system. And so these are the two main problems we're trying to tackle is selectivity and oxidation resistance in, in, in membranes. And so the subject of the talk today is going to be on uh, what we call vapor gap membranes. Um, and this is a completely different type of membrane that we're researching um, that essentially it uses different transport mechanisms and it can get around some of the limitations of TFC or possibly can. 
And so the way this membrane works is it can really be made of a variety of materials, but they need to be hydrophobic and they need to be uh, porous. And so if you take this hydrophobic porous material, we're looking at the side of it here. And so these, this light part is some pores. If you stick it in water, it's hydrophobic enough where it traps air inside those pores. And so it forms an air layer between two different streams. And so if you want to conduct a, a, you know, a separation using this, what you can do is you can just use some driving force. So you could use you know, pressure, you could use concentration, and you could use that to cause the partial vapor pressure on one side of the membrane to be higher than the other. In, in this case, it's higher on the left side than the right side here. Um, and that induces water flow to go from left to right here. Uh, to cross the membrane, you need to have vapor phase transport. And so that means that anything that's not volatile is rejected, which is a lot of salts that we deal with. And so these vapor gap membranes, which are going to be the subject of really the entire you know, presentation today, um, they have some advantages that kind of are kind of like inherent to the design. Um, one is that transport occurs in the gas phase, so non-volatile contaminants are completely rejected. And two, they're made of hydrophobic materials. You can choose whatever material you want, but generally hydrophobic materials are, um, have, have stronger chemical bonds and are less likely to degrade when they're exposed to chemical oxidants, so they're more robust. So that's, that's kind of the advantages we're looking to probe today. And this is just kind of summarizes it. So, you know, TFC membranes are, um, they're really good in terms of energy efficiency and they're widely implemented. But as I said, neutral solutes can pass through and they're vulnerable to chemical oxidants. Um, the vapor gap membranes that we're talking about today, um, they're highly energy efficient um, as well. They have they share that advantage with TFC membranes just because they operate by similar principles, um, but they have the potential to be highly selective and resistant to chemical oxidants. And so in the rest of this talk, pretty much what we're just going to try to do is, is to understand whether these, these potential benefits, which are you know, kind of in principle, not really established you know, experimentally, um, can actually be realized. And so if we can develop a membrane that improves on conventional TFC membranes. Okay. All right, so this first section of the talk is going to talk about vapor gap membranes in osmotic applications. And so when you use a vapor gap membrane in osmotic applications, it's called osmotic distillation. It's an old process. People have been doing it for a while. Um, and the work done today was, uh, that I'm going to speak about today was primarily done by uh, my graduate student, Song Suk Lee, in his first two semesters in graduate school. He, he did an amazing job putting together um, this, this, this work here. Okay, so we're shifting gears a little bit. We were talking about reverse osmosis, which involves pressure. This first study is in an osmotic process that doesn't involve pressure. Um, we wanted to initially avoid pressure because it can cause some problems for the membrane, which I'll go into later. And so in this case, we're using vapor gap membranes in what's called osmotic distillation. Um, and so in this system then, the way it works is you basically have a membrane, you have some feed that you want to you know, purify. So this could be you know, brackish water or something. And you have an engineered draw solution with some high concentration. And so what happens is since you have a higher concentration in the draw than the feed, you pull water across the membrane into the draw, you dilute the draw, and then you can recover it using some different methods um, to get the permeate out and enhance the draw solution and then keep the system going. So I'm not gonna talk too much about this actual process design, but basically what you need to know is it just involves a concentration gradient that drives flow. And this process is actually considered for a variety of applications, mostly in applications with very high salinities where you can use this draw solution to pull water out better than you could with you know, pressure in reverse osmosis. And so this osmotic distillation process has been around for a while, but there's been a lot of recent work in, in membrane development. And so um, you know, we, we actually worked on developing improved membranes for this experimentally, you know, trying to make uh, higher flux membranes. Um, and then there's been a work in other groups too, uh, kind of working with different ways to design membranes that work well for osmotic distillation. Um, and so when I started coming into looking at this problem, when I was speaking with Songsuk about the problem, uh, we started to become curious about what are really the ideal properties for an osmotic distillation membrane. So now we're getting the ability, we can make membranes quite well. So in terms of like establishing say, what's the best pore diameter, what's the best thickness, what's the best porosity, thermal conductivity, you know, we, we really wanted to know what, what should be the target. Uh, the other thing we were curious about is the impact of heat transfer. Um, and so you can imagine that 
if you have evaporation at this feed interface here, and you have condensation at this permeate interface here, you transfer the latent heat of, of vaporization across the membrane. So you're cooling this side of the membrane, the feed side as water evaporates and you're heating the permeate side. And so this is something that we were concerned about because you can imagine your feed temperature will drop near the membrane surface. This is called temperature polarization, TP. And then your, your, your temperature will elevate near the permeate side. So it's, it's higher over here. And if you have that temperature difference, it reduces the available vapor pressure driving force for water to go across the membrane. So we were concerned whether or not, you know, this TP would really limit performance. And the other thing we thought about related to heat transfer was that if you imagine having now a large membrane module like the one that I showed from Israel, you, you have a lot of membrane area with what, for which water will permeate and that water permeating will transfer heat. And so you can imagine eventually as you know, water flows across the feed side, some of it's permeating across, it'll start to cool the feed solution. And so this could again, cause problems for the system. So we went into this wanting to understand, you know, what are the ideal membrane properties for the system? And then how does heat transfer affect operation of the system? And so uh, Songsuk put together um, some amazing kind of simulation methods here. Um, we used mass and heat transport equations that have been like, well established in the literature. And we verified that they could calculate um, you know, accurate water fluxes um, using experimental measurements in our lab. Um, and then we wanted to do large scale modeling too. And so we used a pretty commonly used technique, you know, finite element analysis for large scale simulations. It's nothing complicated. Basically you just break the membrane down into discrete parts that you can you know, calculate. And so the first thing that Songsuk did with this project then is he wanted to look at the range of parameters that we were concerned about and see what effect they had on performance. And so here we define performance as the water recovery, which is basically how much water we can get out of a membrane module. Um, and so a higher value is better. And he varied these four parameters within a realistic range. So within a range that we thought was achievable for thickness, for porosity, for pore diameter, and for thermal conductivity. Um, and what you can see here is just the difference in these bars is really kind of the difference going across the realistic range of parameters, I guess. And so what you can see is that the most significant effect here is with thickness. We can vary thickness a lot. We can vary thickness orders of magnitude. And you can see the water recovery really increases as you go to lower thicknesses. For other parameters, you know, porosity, pore diameter, and thermal conductivity, we're a bit more constrained. So porosity is kind of limited by the material. We can't get much higher than 0.8. Um, for thermal conductivities, again, that's a property of whatever material we use. So we don't have that much leeway. And so from this kind of initial work then, what Songsuk concluded was that, you know, thickness is really the key parameter that we can kind of play around with in this system. Um, and so this is, this is modeling, this is, this is similar to, to previous work that's been done too, where we can show here this membrane thickness has a, a strong effect on the water flux. And so this is the thickness, you look at different pore diameters, um, and you can see here, this is the, the water flux increases as you go to lower thicknesses. Um, you also have a higher water flux with smaller pore diameters because there's less of an opportunity for you know, vapor molecules to collide with the pore walls. Um, and so from this then we could see, okay, lower thicknesses are always better, um, but there is a limit to how low you can go in terms of thickness here. Um, and that's where this turns red here. So this was established, uh, this is previously published in a paper by, by Zhang Ho Li. And he basically showed that, yeah, if you go down to very low thicknesses, what ends up happening is that your menisci can touch and you can have some kind of thermodynamic really favorable wetting occurring. Um, and so what we can say here then is that we want to get high fluxes. So we want to go to low thicknesses, but we don't want to hit this red territory. So we really want to aim for thicknesses probably between one micron and 100 nanometers would be a realistic range for thicknesses. Um, next, we wanted to look at the effect of heat transfer, so these detrimental heat transfer effects. Um, and so we did some modeling of this temperature polarization phenomenon where you have some temperature changes at the immediate kind of boundary layers on each side of the membrane. And so this, this y-axis shows the contribution to flux reduction of a polarization phenomena where a higher number is worse. And the x-axis is again, membrane thickness on the log scale. And so what we can see here is that temperature polarization kind of peaks around maybe 10 micron thickness, 
But as we go less than down to one micron and even 100 nanometers, temperature polarization starts to become less relevant here. And in fact, at this point, concentration polarization becomes the dominant um, resistance. And so this concentration polarization exists in, in all membrane processes. It's, it's, it's hard to avoid having this. So once we get to this regime, say moving below one micron, we're in a pretty good place where we don't have these adverse temperature polarization effects. Um, looking at the module scale, like when I talked about before, you can have heat accumulating along the length of the module, changing kind of like the bulk temperature. And so we call this temperature accumulation. And again, this is the contribution to a loss in partial vapor pressure difference. So a high number indicates a larger contribution. And so we can see as we decrease thickness again here, the, the impact of temperature accumulation drops. And as we approach membranes less than one micron thick, we start to minimize the, the appearance of temperature accumulation in these systems. So, okay, now we have a good understanding of, you know, heat transfer phenomena of optimal membrane properties. And the last thing we did with this modeling work was just to show, compare OD membranes, like so osmotic distillation, vapor gap membranes to conventional TFC membranes used in forward osmosis. So we simulated TFC membrane properties based on values available in the literature. And we used our models to also simulate kind of an optimized vapor gap membrane. And this vapor gap membrane, since the, the hydrophobic layer is very thin, you know, that we were saying this is between 100 nanometers and one micron, um, we would mount it, we, we simulated it as if it's on top of a hydrophilic support layer because a, a one micron thick freestanding film is just going to fall apart. So this is, this is how we simulate it. And, and so it en ends up being the structure is actually very similar between vapor gap membranes and TFC membranes. And so Song Suk ran the simulation. I'm just showing one part of it because uh, it gets kind of crazy. But this is the water flux that you can achieve. So you want more water flux. Um, and this is as a function of, this is the hydrophobic layer thickness of the OD membrane. And this is the water permeability. It's just the same axis. So as you make the membrane thinner, you have a higher water flux. And then this drops off here at this value where you know wetting becomes favorable. We also simulated the FO membrane and interestingly enough, the FO membrane actually had lower water fluxes in our simulated conditions. And the reason for this is you can modulate the water permeability of an FO membrane, but when you do that, you also, if you increase water permeability in a standard TFC membrane, you also increase the amount of salt that can go across the membrane. And so when you have more salt transport, that leads to some detrimental effects that decrease the available water flux. And so um, the FO membrane had lower measured water fluxes or lower simulated water fluxes. Um, the issue of, of membranes becoming leaky, of FO membranes becoming leaky at high water permeabilities was also evident when we simulated the salt rejection of these membranes. And so as you go to very high permeabilities, the membrane selectivity starts to become compromised. And so you start to get to a regime where you don't have a very strong selective uh, removal of salts from the, the water. Okay, so that's it for the first section um, that, that Song Suk worked on. Um, we concluded that reducing the membrane thickness is, is a great avenue to um, improve osmotic distillation membrane design. And so this is what many people were already doing in the literature. And so it kind of confirmed that this is you know, the right path forward. Um, and we also showed that thin vapor gap membranes have low temperature polarization and heat accumulation. Um, finally, we did some simulations so that osmotic distillation membranes could outperform polyamide TFC membranes, um, especially in applications that require high selectivity. Okay, so this is, now we're going to move on. This was kind of, you know, wetting our appetite for the system. And then after, or kind of simultaneously with this work, we, we were doing some work on development of vapor gap membranes for reverse osmosis applications. So this is really kind of like the big application for us because reverse osmosis is a much, much bigger market than osmotic separation systems. Um, and so this, this work was, was led by Dion, who, who's on the call here. Um, Song Suk also worked on this project. And, and now uh, we have contributions from various group members in the lab as well, Elizabeth, Hannah, and Kian. So the reason that we were hesitant initially to uh, look at the reverse osmosis process is because it requires a lot of pressure. Um, and so you can imagine you know, you need to use pressure to push to drive water, either water vapor or, you know, liquid water through a membrane and get to the other side. And these pressures can be really, really high. 
Uh, I don't know what units everybody uses, but they can be above, you know, like 70 bar. It can be above, you know, 800 PSI. It, those are the units I, I use. So I, that's all I got. But, but anyway, it's really high pressures. And so it, it, in theory, this, this process would work very well. And in fact, Junko did some simulations showing that it, it could work. Because basically what you do is you apply pressure, you increase the partial vapor pressure here that those molecules will diffuse through the membrane and then come out the other side. And just based on pressure, you can get a really nice partial vapor pressure difference here. But the issue when you actually try to do this in the real world is if you put pressure on this, liquid water just enters the pores and goes right through the membrane. And once that happens, you know, it's, it's game over, right? You, you're gonna have solutes going through, you, you, you lose all of your selectivity here. And so that's really what's been the limiting factor is, is this wetting phenomenon that happens at high pressures and it's been pretty hard to surmount and we were scared to go into this area. Um, but in theory, membranes can withstand these high pressures. So the, the pressure at which this liquid entry happens is defined by the Young-Laplace equation. And so there's some parameters in here. So this is the highest, this is the, the operating pressure you can get to. Um, it's a function of some geometric coefficient, the surface tension of water, don't vary that much. And then it's a function of the contact angle of water on the membrane surface which is how we express the relative hydrophobicity of a given surface. And it's also a function of R max. This is the maximum pore size in the membrane. So you want a small pore size and you want a high hydrophobicity to get a high operating pressure. And so that's shown here, this is the maximum pressure or the liquid entry pressure. And um, this is the theoretical curve generated by the Young-Laplace equation for a contact angle of 120 degrees, which is the upper limit of what you can really get with the surface. And so these are values that were acquired from the literature. Um, this is, you know, these are existing membranes used for a process called membrane distillation. They tend to have very low liquid entry pressures and relatively high pore sizes. Um, and so most, most values are below, you know, five bar, which isn't anywhere close to what you need to do for RO. And the highest value in the literature was actually from our previous work around 13 bar with PTFE. And it's still really not high enough to do you know, conventional RO with. And so there's a big need then to try to ride this curve up to get to higher pressures. And ideally, if you wanna do seawater desal, so you have some really salty water, you need to go to pressures at least above 40 bar. Um, I don't know what the other units are. Okay, so we, we set to work uh, fabricating these, uh, these high pressure resistance membranes. Um, we used 80, uh, 20, 40 and 80 nanometer pore size ceramic membranes. Um, and we just did a, a silane modification, which is, is pretty well established in the literature for making hydrophobic surfaces. It can be used to make some of the most hydrophobic surfaces. Basically what you do is you just react a silane with hydroxyl groups on the membrane surface, and that makes the surface hydrophobic. And so after modification, um, you know, we went from a very hydrophilic surface to the point where the membrane wets to a surface that is highly hydrophobic. Um, and so, you know, I, I'm showing this fabrication in one slide, but you know, Jiang spent like I don't know I don't know how many painful months uh, running these modifications over and over and over again, and everything breaks and fails. But for the purpose of the presentation, you know, you can do it, and it's it's nice to show it in just one slide. Sorry if you also hear there's a snowblower outside, but maybe you don't hear it. <laughs> we got like a foot last night or something like that. Okay, so Jiang spent a long painful time making these membranes. Um, and eventually we could see, okay, we can get to higher operating pressure. So this is the 20 nanometer membrane, 40 nanometer, 80 nanometer membrane. And we were, I, I was completely blown away because we were getting to pressures, you know, we're getting like three times, almost four times the pressure that we've seen before. Um, and we were doing it with these, these membranes that we fabricated in the lab. So we're, we're getting closer to being able to ride this kind of curve up to higher operating pressures. And we're in the range with the smallest pore size. We're actually in the range where you can do seawater desal, which is crazy. So we were really, really excited about this. So, you know, this is a lot, a lot of pain for for Zion to running these experiments. And so we went on to test and see, okay, do these membranes actually work for you know desalination? And so we built this this cell. We stole a bucket and you know, put a cell in it. We we changed the temperature a little bit. Um, and basically, all we do here is we apply some pressure across a membrane. Um, and we can regulate the temperature here. And so what we see is as we increase the pressure, uh, we have a linear increase in the water flux for each membrane pore size. So this is 20, 40, 80 nanometer pore size. Uh, these I think are triplicate experiments. 
uh, where we can show a very nice linear relationship. So it's already a good sign that we have an osmotic membrane if there's a linear trend between water flux and applied pressure. We then went on to test the rejection with these membranes. So we first used some red dye. Um, and so we just put a bunch of red dye in the feed and then we uh, measured the, the, we looked at the dye in the permeate and we, you can use UV-Vis to you know, quantify it. So here's the spectra of the feed, you know, here's the permeate, there's DI water, you can't, you can't tell the difference. So we, we, we were getting really high rejection. Um, and then for the, the feed, we, we also tried 50 millimolar sodium chloride. Um, and so this is, we were measuring electroconductivity. Keep in mind, this is a, a log scale on the Y axis. And so we did 50 millimolar sodium chloride for these three different membrane pore sizes. And okay, the feed has a conductivity that is associated with 50 millimolar sodium chloride. The permeate, the conductivity drops by about three orders of magnitude. So we're seeing really, really high rejection around 99.9%. .9%. And in fact, it's hard to even quantify the rejection at this point because our permeate starts to really just resemble DI water. So we're getting super, super high rejection values here. Uh, and so we were, again, blown away that these membranes were working well. I think I tried to quantify it and the number of defects here is like there's less than one in 10 million pores that would be wetted or something. So it's really, really nice, nice films. And so we went on to, you know, do some testing and see if the practical advantages that I talked about at the start of this talk could actually be realized. Um, we did uh, solute rejection tests for a few key contaminants. Boron, which is in seawater, and it's, it's bad for agriculture, so we have to remove it to certain levels. Uh, NDMA, which is a, a common uh, you know, uh, pollutant, I think it's more prevalent for, for water reuse. And, and urea, which is you know, in urine, and it's, it's of interest if you want to you know, reuse urine for space applications or, or different kind of waste streams. So all these, these contaminants are poorly rejected by TFCRO membranes. We, we did the measurements ourselves. Uh, here, and you can see, you know, below 50% rejection, which isn't great at all for standard TFCRO membranes. For the vapor gap membranes, we saw higher than 95% removal, most in cases around 98 or 99% removal. NDMA was a bit lower because it actually is, you know, slightly volatile, so it'll go across the membrane a little bit. So again, really, really high selectivity with these membranes. And then we also wanted to test the oxidation resistance, and when we were talking about doing the oxidation resistance tests, I think we started off by just saying, okay, let's take some like, you know, bleach and just, you know, throw the membranes in there and see what happens. Uh, and so this is our experiments. Uh, if there's anybody from a funding agency, we could use nicer stir, stir plates. Um, and so we, we just, you know, tossed some membranes in some different solutions of chlorine. And we, we saw, we just wanted to check out what happened. And so this is the, you know, a good parameter to, to see if it changes is the salt rejection. And this is the chlorine exposure. So the, you know, the concentration times time for chlorine. And so what we could see is, okay, the vapor gap RO membranes don't really see any change in rejection. TFC RO membranes are heavily degraded by chlorine. You know, as I showed the chemistry before, the, the chlorine will start to attack bonds within uh, the TFC RO membrane and eventually break it apart. Uh, we did the same thing with ozone, which is a stronger oxidant. Um, and we, again, didn't really see a difference with the vapor gap RO membranes, um, but we did with the TFC RO membranes, um, you know, we saw rejection dropped to uh, pretty much, you know, zero. So uh, we, we see a kind of unprecedented oxidation resistance with these membranes. And so that's all I'm going to talk about here. You know, we're, we're working on getting this, this work published. Um, but, you know, vapor gap membranes, we showed here, they can operate at pressures greater than 40 bar, which is something, you know, I, I didn't really expect to be able to see. And so that, that means they can, they can do seawater desalination. Um, these membranes can achieve near complete uh, removal of non-volatile solutes. Um, and so we, we showed, you know, conductivities approaching DI water in the permeate here. And we showed that these membranes don't really show a loss in performance after exposure to, you know, the ozone and chlorine concentrations that we used. Although, you know, we, we were trying to go to higher concentrations now and see, you know, when we see some effect. Um, I, I put power generation in my title, but I, I realized when I was putting this presentation together that I probably wouldn't have time to cover it. Um, so uh, suffice to say, you know, I, I like talking about th this previous work. We, we had some previous work where we also used uh, a temperature difference to generate some power using vapor gap membranes. I'm not going to go into it in detail. There, there's a paper uh, that we published in 2016 about it, and there's been subsequent work on this area. I, I have backup slides in case anybody wants to chat about it afterwards. Um, but I just like 
at least bringing up this work because it, it shows th these vapor gap membranes are versatile for a variety of applications that really can be used for a lot of cool stuff. Okay, so just to summarize what we talked about here today, um, hopefully you've learned about some kind of interesting different type of membrane that maybe you haven't heard of. Um, for me, it's, it's a fundamentally interesting area. You know, there's interfacial phenomenon, there's mass transfer, there's heat transfer. And then we showed these vapor gap membranes can offer potential to replace conventional TFC membranes, especially in applications that require high selectivity or some oxidation resistance. Um, and so now, you know, we're, we're working in, you know, seeing a, can we scale this up? You know, do they work in a practical system? Like, you know, what's fouling going to do? All this other stuff. Um, but, but in the end, the, the takeaway is that these membranes do show some promise to replace conventional TFC membranes. Um, and so with that, I'd like to, again, uh, acknowledge the, the people who did the work on this. Um, here's, this is like a, our pre-COVID lunch before we got new group members too. We went to a Korean restaurant. We're going, we're going skiing in a week, hopefully. Um, and so we'll have, we'll have a new picture in a week, but we, we don't have it now. Uh, and thanks again to Jung Ho Lee. Uh, and also I'm going to acknowledge our funding sources, um, the MAST Center Bureau of Reclamation and AMTA. Um, and so with that, I'm really happy to um, take any questions from you all. Um, thanks.